Hey everybody, we are going to um, talk about theoretical foundations of stuttering, part one. Okay. So we're talking about childhood onset stuttering here. We're not talking about um, acquired stuttering or anything like that. So there's no universal definition of stuttering and no one knows what causes it. That's not really as true now as it used to be. There, we've got a lot of genetic causes and um, things like that, but overall it's still true. A sign of a competent clinician may be that she does not easily provide an answer to the question, what causes stuttering for Walt Manning? Um, you know, if, if somebody has an easy answer to the cause of stuttering or an easy answer to um, certainly the treatment of stuttering, um, that will often show, you know, that the person's probably not competent in um, working with stuttering. So we've got a long history of stuttering. There are Egyptian hieroglyphics um, that represented the term nit-nit, um, which represented stuttering. In the Bible, um, Moses was heavy of speech and heavy of tongue. Um, Moses did a lot of the work to go up and get the commandments and then had his brother Aaron read the Ten Commandments out loud. Um, so, you know, he kind of avoided the speaking part of that. So a lot of people think that in the Bible, Moses was probably somebody who stuttered. In the Quran, Moses said, my Lord, relieve my mind and ease my task for me and loose the knot from my tongue that they may understand my saying. Um, so again, probably stuttering or um, a speech sound disorder, but it, it certainly sounds a lot like stuttering, right? So Right. Why is this important? Um, number one, right, that stuttering has been around pretty much forever. And also, right, um, you know, Moses was a pretty successful person in history. So, you know, you can stutter and still be pretty successful. All right. So from the time of Aristotle to the Renaissance, um, a malformed tongue was the most popular culprit, the most popular cause of stuttering. Um, and then, you know, unfortunately then, um, removing parts of the tongue, piercing, blistering the tongue were popular treatments in the 18th and 19th centuries. And um, then in the early 1900s in the United States, uh, tonsil and adenoidectomies were popular treatments. You know, I, I don't, I don't really want to have my tonsils removed in 1910. You know, that does not sound like a great time um, if they don't need to be removed. Um, right. So if we're thinking about this, right. So the problem is the tongue. And then we start to move back further inside to the tonsils, the adenoids. And then it's only a matter of time that we get more and more sophisticated and we end up with the brain, right? So in the 1920s, it was believed that more people who stutter were naturally left-handed or ambidextrous and that stuttering actually emerged as they were forced to make their right hand their dominant hand. So children were often forced to use their right hand when handwriting, when throwing, um, when doing lots of tasks. Um, and so um, the very earliest research in our field was actually on theories of cerebral dominance in stuttering. Um, from Orton and Travis. It was believed that one hemisphere had to be dominant over the other to control the timing of the speech movement. And, and that, that is somewhat correct in that, right? If things are all over the place, um, you know, this is a, we'll talk about in a second, that this is a really complicated process for speaking. 
and that you know if one area isn't sort of taking the lead here um, we're going to have difficulties um, so you know there have been studies showing that people who stutter have more right brain activation for speech um, more research is needed and really what's been shown is that people who stutter have their neural activation you know all over their brain um, is that the cause of stuttering? Is that a result of a speech motor system that's not working optimally? And so the brain tries to bypass that in different ways. And so you end up with a lot of activation um, on multiple areas. Is it a cause of stuttering, an effect of stuttering? Is it both? Maybe. Um, now, unfortunately, right, so we're, we're moving in the right direction here, right? Really early on in the 20s, we're moving in the right direction. Um, but then Freud, you know, had, had really taken over psychology and a lot of Freudian theory um, is going to be involved in speech pathology as well. Um, you know, Freud, certainly a lot of positives with Freud, right? Talking about the importance of, of children, the importance of what happens to children, um, that what happens early on with us plays a big role in who we are, right? But there's also a lot wrong with Freud, um, you know? So really, really soon, Freud kind of takes over our thinking here. So conflicts that the cause of stuttering now is in conflicts involving the needs of infants. We get into things like oral and anal eroticism, dependence, aggressiveness, self-assertion, um, really disturbed parent-child relationships, that there was something wrong with how mom nursed the child, with the toilet training of the child, which again is usually mom um, at that time was in charge of, parental anxiety, usually mom's parental anxiety, right? So we get into this idea that this was caused by mom, that mom was doing something wrong, mom was in charge of a disturbed parent-child relationship, mom screwed up in nursing, mom screwed up in toilet training, mom is overly anxious, right? So, and that's going to cause, so when we talk about these next things, you know, Freud is going to play a big role. So, Maybe the most important theory to know for the praxis exam um, and to and also just to understand because it played a role in stuttering, how stuttering was treated for a very long time. The diagnosogenic theory from Wendell Johnson at the University of Iowa um, started in the early 40s. And this, this theory really carried through into the 1980s. Um, so the idea was that stuttering was an anticipatory, apprehensive, hypertonic avoidance reaction. What does that mean? Stuttering is what the speaker does when he expects stuttering to occur, dreads the stuttering and becomes tense in anticipation of it and in trying to avoid it, right? So. Stuttering um, is what the speaker does when he expects the stuttering, anticipatory, dreads it, becomes apprehensive, becomes really tense in the anticipation of stuttering, hypertonic, and in, then tries to avoid it, um, the avoidance reaction, right? Now, of course, what's wrong with this theory is that, well, then how does stuttering, like how can you expect stuttering to occur unless it's already occurred? Right, so that's a problem. This is the dominant theory in the 40s and 50s and really through the 1980s. And so, right, it, it's called the diagnosogenic theory because stuttering develops when normal disfluencies are misdiagnosed by parents and listeners as stuttering, right? So parents, listeners hear, normal, typical disfluencies, parents, um, listeners start to, 
you know, tell children to stop and start over, to speak correctly, to speak differently. Um, and the child then anticipates difficulty and the whole diagnosogenic theory process. So the cause of stuttering was placed, you know, firmly on environmental factors. Again, usually looking at mom as the cause of the problem, right? Now we know today that that's not true, that from very early on, right, the kinds of speech disfluencies we see are going to be the stuttering-like disfluencies for kids who stutter, the short segment repetitions, the prolongations, the blocks, and not the typical disfluency. So this theory is completely wrong, um, but it played a huge role, right? Um, in fact, it's not, you know, it can, we can still get to the point where, you know, pediatricians continue to tell parents, ignore it and it will go away, right? So if the, if the cause of stuttering is that listeners are overreacting to moments of stuttering, right? The treatment then is for, have, for parents just to ignore it, wait for kids to finish, don't even mention it, don't talk about it, and it will go away, right? Now, one of the big problems with this is, um, well, I mean, there are a few problems, but one problem is it really leads to the conspiracy of silence, right? So you've got a child who's struggling, who's having a really hard time speaking, who's maybe uncomfortable in their speaking, and no one's talking about it, right? Parents aren't talking about it, they're telling other people not to talk about it. And so kids start to think, wow, this is really bad, right? I must be doing something so bad that parents won't talk about it, right? So stuttering gets placed in the category of sex, of things that happen in the bathroom, of Uncle Billy's drinking problem, right? Things that are so bad that we're not gonna talk about it. Um, it's gonna lead to a lot of shame. Right, shame's often what happens when we don't talk about things. So if that was bad. Then also, right, you don't get treatment too. You just uh, ignore it; it will go away. Um, so it takes the speech pathologist out of the equation. Now, for a long time, speech pathologists were, you know, really followed this theory, and so they would have told them the same thing. But that that has stopped a while ago. But you know this this theory was so prevalent that sometimes um, parents will still get this message. All right, um, so kind of tied in with that, with the diagnosogenic theory, was the instrumental avoidance theory by Vishner. Um, so stuttering begins with the diagnosogenic theory, and then stuttering continues because of the reward it brings. The reinforcement was the reduction in tension and anxiety immediately following stuttering, right? So you have the moment of stuttering and then you're rewarded for that by the reduction in tension. Um, kind of a crazy theory, right? It's like if you get hit in the head with a hammer, right? Um, the reduction in tension and anxiety after you're hit with the hammer will make you want to get hit with a hammer again, right? It really it just doesn't make any sense. Um, and then the last major theory kind of tied into the diagnosogenic theory was Bloodstein's anticipatory struggle hypothesis. As the person who stutters fears speech, they tense, ensuring stuttering. So you get nervous about speech, um, you tense up. So stuttering is the result of the person tensing and then fragmenting the speech segment. So, you know, what, what was really going on here, right? Johnson, Bloodstein. Um, Johnson was a person who stuttered himself. Um, and Bloodstein did tons and tons and tons and tons of research into stuttering, one of the great researchers in stuttering. Um, and the problem was, right, most of the research was on adults who stutter. So we've got Johnson taking his own sort of feelings as an adult who stutters. We've got Bloodstein doing, you know, looking through every article that had ever been written about stuttering, which 95% of them had been done on people age 12 and up at that point. Um, 
and going, oh, you know, the more people fear they're stuttering, they're going to tense up and they're going to stutter even more. So this must be the cause of stuttering. The problem is it's not the cause of stuttering, but it is, you know, it does give us insight into Right. The more you worry about your stuttering, often for people who stutter, the more they're going to stutter. So there is some therapeutic value here for kids and for adults um, that's there. But as an actual cause of stuttering, it's tremendously flawed, incorrect. Um, so um, we kind of didn't get anywhere for a very long time. Um, then we get to the approach avoidance conflict with Sheehan. Um, Joe Sheehan had been a client of Van Riper's um, years ago and had went on to get his doctorate in psychology at UCLA. Um, and he's a you know, person who stutters. And so he wrote that the person wants to speak, they want to approach speaking, but they also want to be silent, which is avoidance because they're afraid of stuttering. And that when both desires are equal, you end up with stuttering. So you want to talk, but you're afraid to talk. And so you end up getting a block or you know, getting stuck in a repetition or a prolongation because you're kind of in that halfway point, right? And it was Sheehan who came up with the stuttering iceberg talking about how important feelings are um, to stuttering. Um, again, though, not, not a cause of stuttering, um, but a, a good, again, there's therapeutic value here right in the idea that if you're again if you're afraid of speaking afraid of stuttering um it's going to make talking a lot harder we also then have the two factor theory from brutton and schumacher in the 60s um right now we're getting now we're getting back somewhere right now we're getting back to neurological so stuttering begins with a neurological predisposition to stutter which then interacts with two types of conditioning right we've got classical conditioning and we've got instrumental or operant conditioning right classical conditioning is an association with two stimuli right so that when we think about that we can think about um Pavlov, right, and the dogs and the bell. And we can think about how the dogs learn to associate food with the ringing of the bell. So they'll start to salivate just with the bell alone. In stuttering, right, um, you get that feeling that, oh, I'm going to stutter. And then that leads to pushing and struggling and those things go together. And then we've got operant conditioning, which is the frequency that a behavior occurs, is related to the consequences that follow, right? So operant conditionings about rewards and punishments, um, right? So here we're talking about, um, really we're talking about secondary behaviors. We're talking about escape and avoidance behaviors, right? That, oh, you know, if I stutter, I get a negative consequence. So I'm going to escape out of it, do some kind of escape behavior like an um, an eye blink, mid stutter, and that's going to help the stuttering pop out. So I'm going to do it again, right? Or an avoidance behavior. Oh, I changed a word. I didn't speak. I pretended to be thinking. Oh, people didn't see me stutter. That was positive. I'm going to do it again, right? So there's this learning involved. So it, it begins as a neurological disorder, but then through classical and operant conditioning, um, there's a lot of learning involved that makes the stuttering more complicated um, and harder, and that that's going to be really lead into the stuttering problem. All right. So we're going to stop here for part one of stuttering theory.